I threw a rock at his front door, went back into my apartment, thinking everything's fine, get a knock on the door. Uh, it was the police and they wanted me to come out in front of the apartment and I said, was yelling and say, no, you don't have a search warrant, you can't come in without one. Um, and I thought they had left. I thought they had gone away. Uh, and I went out the back door of my apartment to do laundry. And there were two police officers with guns pointed at me um, and also at my dog. So I started yelling at them and I started calling them names and I was very vulgar. Uh, and you know, you're not supposed to do that to the police. Uh, and so I tried to close the door of the apartment because I was scared to death what they were gonna do. Uh, and they broke through the door frame and came in and it turned into um, a large aggressive uh, fight between two police officers and myself. Uh, I thought they were gonna kill me, so I did everything I could to protect myself and to try to hurt them. Uh, I threw, I had a little fishing tool on the counter. I threw it at one of the police officers. Uh, it didn't hit him, uh, but that was called assault, assault with a deadly weapon. And I later learned that even if it was a pencil, it would have been considered that. One of the um, side effects of the medication I take is dry mouth. So uh, <laughs> we'll get to that a little later. Uh, but so we were fighting and uh, there were the two police officers, myself, were fighting. I was knocked out and woke up and I was covered with blood and I had an HIV AIDS t-shirt on because I had been working in the AIDS community, educating people, and I wore those t-shirts all the time. So each cop picked me up, covered with blood, come out of the apartment, and there's police cars and fire engines, and I really didn't know what was going on, but I was still yelling, creating a scene, you know, manic, out of control. Um, until they put me in handcuffs and put me into the police car. We went to one of the hospitals nearby. They handcuffed me to the gurney inside the emergency room and uh, basically um, wanted me to try to calm down, but of course I was yelling at everyone, calling everyone names, uh, but they did decided they were gonna do a CT scan of my head because they had punched me so many times, they were afraid there may have been some type of brain damage. Uh, luckily there wasn't, but when they took me in the back to try to clean up all the wounds and the blood, the nurses just threw sponges to me and told me to clean myself up because they were afraid that I had AIDS. Now this is just 10 years ago so people should have known about universal precautions and been uh, more educated and informed, uh, but obviously they weren't. Uh, there was someone that I knew that worked at the hospital and I asked them to bring her down and I begged her, please have them Baker Act me. Have them hospitalize me involuntarily. Um, and the police officers said no, She's our prisoner, we're taking her to jail. And I was charged with assault and battery on two law enforcement officers, okay? I still don't, didn't know what was going on with me. I just thought everyone was after me, you know? And that's a common theme too, when you're going through a mental illness and you're not taking medication to control the symptoms, is you can think of different delusions, hearing voices, seeing things, uh, and that was all happening for me. Uh, they took me down to the police station and I ended up being in jail for 10 months. Okay, when I first went into jail, and this is in Fort Lauderdale, uh, I did not take any medication. 
I refused to take medication because the person, the nurse that was coming around taking, giving out the medication, he reminded me of someone that I did not like. Now, I don't know who this person was, but you know, he reminded me of someone, it was some traumatic experience, and I just would refuse to. So they kept me in like solitary confinement. Um, they would let us out like for an hour to walk around and take a shower, but then you had to go back into your cell. Uh, and one day, I probably was in solitary confinement for probably about three to four weeks, and then they sent a female nurse to come around and she looked at me and we met eyes and there was something about her eyes. She was very kind and she said, please take the medication, just try it for me. If you don't like it, you don't have to keep taking it. So I tried it and not right away, but probably about four weeks, I started coming around thinking, oh my gosh, like reality was hitting me. Whereas before, I was still hearing voices and, and, and seeing things that weren't there. Now, I was kind of figuring out like something was wrong. So I was able to get better, little by little, through the different units in the um, jail. And I do have to say that I'm very glad I was arrested in Fort Lauderdale rather than Miami, because um, Broward County actually has a mental health unit in their jail. So not only did they give me medication, but they also had social workers come in and teach you about the mental health issue that you were dealing with. Uh, with mine, that was the first time anyone ever said that you have bipolar illness. I call it bipolar illness rather than bipolar disorder because disorder to me has a negative connotation. And for me, I have had to reframe everything that was going on for me um, to make it a little bit more positive so I could accept it. Because all of this happened when I was 40. Prior to that, I had gone to college, I had my master's in counseling. I was supposed to be the one helping everyone else. And then when my life was falling apart, I didn't know how to handle it. Prior to the mania, I had gone through a really, really deep depression. So I got an antidepressants. And those worked great for the depression, but then I started becoming manic because if you're not on the right medication, it, it doesn't work the right way. And all of our brains are different, so we're all gonna respond differently to different medications that we take. So back to the jail, I was learning what this disease, this chronic illness was, and how I could control it. Um, there was a lot of work on uh, looking back at my childhood, which was quite traumatic. Not, not like many people have much more traumatic childhoods than mine, but my parents uh, were alcoholics. They fought a lot. My father abused my mom physically and emotionally, and I was the oldest, so then I would get involved trying to protect her. Um, and so the anger and the rage that I had pushed down for all those years until I left home at the age of 17 seemed like it all came out during this manic encounter with the police. Uh, and because I fought so hard and the adrenaline and it was, it was this catharsis of letting go of that anger and it's bad that it had to happen the way it did, but in the end, it was really good to get all that out. You know, because when we push down the stress and the, the issues and the experiences that really can um, disrupt our lives, we're, we're, we keep that inside of us and it's really not healthy. Um, so 
in jail as I advanced. Uh, Broward County Jail, they have um, four different units. The first was a solitary confinement, and then as I got better, they would put me into a different unit. They didn't know what they were gonna do. The uh, prosecutors wanted to send me to prison, and that would have been for five years for the assault and battery on two law enforcement officers and the deadly weapon. The social workers wanted to send me to the state hospital. But the state hospital is for really if you don't understand the charges that are filed against you. But my brain was reacting so well to the medication that I was understanding what was happening. And Excuse me. A case manager from a mental health agency ended up coming into the jail, called me for an appointment. And, and in jail, at least in Fort Lauderdale, Pompano Beach jail, when they call you and they say someone is here to see you, you never know who it is. They don't say this is your, your mom or your best friend or a counselor or anything. Uh, so I had no idea who it was going to be. And it was this man, very kind man, and he said, um, we want to try to get you out of here, and we're going to help you if you accept the help. And if you are willing to work with us and you accept the fact that you have the bipolar illness. And uh, I had no other choice, really. I was 40 years old. I had lost everything that I had worked for up to this point. I had been evicted, of course, when I got in the fight with the landlord. Um, my uh, car had been repossessed so when you're in jail, especially for 10 months. You can't pay any bills, okay? So my credit, lost all the credit, um, which again, many of us think that that's a huge deal, but the best part of what I went through was realizing how much more important freedom is. Freedom is amazingly uh, something that can change your life when it's taken away. And we don't think about that until we are in the situation in which I was. Um, little by little, the case manager kept coming and they ended up coming to, uh, in Broward County, mental health court. And I was sentenced to uh, an assisted living facility, which is basically, um, it was like an apartment complex, but you have people living there. Some may have mental illness. Some may have a, a drug habit. Some may be um, on, uh, their families don't ha have any other place to put them. So they put them in this uh, assisted living facility. So I was court ordered there and told that they had to supervise me taking medication each day. And when they transported me from jail to the assisted living facility, I was taking, taken in handcuffs in a Broward Sheriff's Office car so when um, this car pulled up to the uh, assisted living facility, of course, people are seeing this going on, and so people know I've broken the law or done something, um, which is hard, too, because I, I was uh, well known in the community for all the HIV AIDS work I had done, and now I'm out, and now I'm seen in handcuffs right in the middle of Fort Lauderdale. Um, I don't have a car anymore, so anywhere that I want to go, I take the bus. So now I'm sitting on the bus um, benches. And if you've never had to take the bus, it is very challenging, especially in Florida, okay? Because you're dealing with the heat, you're dealing with the rain, you're dealing with people driving by and, and yelling things to you. Um, and I had never thought about it before until, again, that was taken away from me as having my own car and my own vehicle and my own freedom to go where I wanted to go. 
So um, with the uh, living there at the ALF, um, I was very bored, very, very bored. And the lawyer that I had, she said, if I could get my mind together, I could come to her office and file and answer the phone. And she had an office in Miami. I had to live at this assisted living facility in Broward County. And what I did is my mind started coming back. I was very slow at first when I started taking the medication. Uh, but I committed to working in her law office five days a week, full time, for $150 under the table. And my days would start around 5, 5.30, get at the bus stop, take a bus, two buses to the tri-rail station in Fort Lauderdale, take the train, which is like a train if you're not familiar with South Florida, take that train to a different train in Miami, transfer trains to uh, 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 down by a university and then walk probably about half a mile to her office. And I did that for two and a half years. And I, by the time I got home at night, it was probably like 8, 8.30. So it was really difficult and it was very challenging. And at any point I could have stopped that and said, screw it. You know, I'm over this, I don't want to do this anymore, but I was on probation and I wanted to get back to the place where I was, which I was a professional. And this had happened to me and I had to start my life completely over. And there's many people that I know and that have decided, you know, screw it. I'm going to violate my probation and it's really easy to do that because, too, um, the guards, when you leave, at least when I left jail, they all said, we'll see you again. You'll be here. You're going to violate your probation and you'll be back here. You're going to do something. So they are, don't encourage you. You know, it was the social workers in there that did, uh, thank goodness. And the um, agency that I was working with that was helping me to live in this assisted living facility. Um, they were paying for it through a grant, which no longer exists. There's no more money coming through in the, a program like that. So I was very, very blessed. Um, so I, I did the traveling from Fort Lauderdale to Miami for two and a half years. And during that time, a person from the agency, he would come out to see me probably about every two weeks to check on how I was doing and he would bring me my medication and we would just talk and he went through a similar situation to me not not similar situation that I did not to the extent as far as jail and being beat up and assaulting police officers but he had gone through a very deep dark depression and he still struggled with it even though he was working and trying to help people, he, he, he you know, it's something that he dealt with each day. Um, his name was Alfonso, and they called his position a peer specialist. And one day when he came to visit me, he said, you know, you're really good with the people that live here. You, and you get all types of people. And he said, you're very patient with them. We have a peer specialist job opening and you should apply. All you needed was a high school diploma. And, um, and I had a master's, but it really didn't matter. What really mattered was I had the life experience. I, had gone, I was going through this. And so we were able to be peers that way in that we had both gone through these mental health issues. Um, so I applied for the job, and granted, I was still doing the stuff with the lawyer for that was like two and a half years, and she wasn't the healthiest. She had helped me out of the legal situation, but she wasn't the healthiest person for me to be around, and she, um, she had no problem telling the coworkers 
uh, all the details of my story and everything like that, which I did not appreciate, you know. Whatever story we have to tell about our life, it should be our decision when we want to tell people or if we never want to tell anyone, okay? Um, so I ended up getting the job as a peer specialist and they said, you can work for this agency, but if you work here, you cannot be a client here. And I said, well, I want, I want to work. I don't, you know, I'll be a client somewhere else and get my medication somewhere else. Um, and during that time, right before that happened to the counselor, they, they automatically want you to apply for disability um, because they think, you know, you're not going to recover. You're just going to get your disability, take your medication, sit around, do nothing. And that's not the vision I had for myself. I wanted to work. I knew I could work. Maybe it wasn't to the extent that I had done things before, but I knew I could. So I became a peer specialist at a mental health agency. And basically it um, have been working with people with mental health issues and substance abuse issues since that time. And um, I'm doing pretty good, you know. The, uh, and I want you all to know, you can ask me any questions that you have. Because many times we hear about people that have some type of illness and we're curious about it, but we're afraid to ask. So I just want you to, have, to know that you have the, the freedom you know, to, to do that. There's nothing I'm going to be offended um, about either. Uh, so, so now being, I, I work down in um, Miami, in Dade County, and I uh, work with another peer specialist, and I actually manage a peer services department uh, and basically try to help other people in the community with the challenging paths that they have in their life and the different journeys that they are going through too. Um, and what I have found is that there's a whole lot of stigma around mental illness. And it's also uh, something that each culture, each community has their own views on it too. Um, in, in some communities that I've worked with, they don't want to talk about it at all. You know, they, you know, something's wrong with the family member, but, you know, we're not going to say mental health issue, or we're not going to address that they're depressed or they have schizophrenia or they have bipolar illness. Um, and so by not talking about that, it, it makes it harder. It makes it harder for the person that's living with the illness and it makes it hard for the family too. But it, it's, it's just all part of the process, you know? And, and with a lot of the families I work with in South Florida, it's easier for them to say, my son or daughter has a drug habit then my son or daughter has schizophrenia. Uh, I heard someone over there say true. <laughs> um, and our, you know, when everybody has, when anybody has a problem, everybody sees him at oh no, he's crazy. You know, or yeah. Mm -hmm. So they don't understand that it's an illness and it can be cured. Yes, yes, and, and, and part of what I have to do too because is um, other, I changed a lot of other things in my life. I, I, when, when I wasn't taking the medication, I did not know I was manic. All my life I had gone through kind of some little ups and downs, especially with my family and especially around holidays, I, I would get really depressed. And I think it's because I was around my family more than I was at other times. But I also remember going through times where I had a whole lot of energy. 
and I could do a whole lot of homework and then I could do I could play sports and I could work out and people would say oh what are you taking what you know what if vitamins are you taking I want to have the energy that you have um, and it wasn't until when I was 40 and when my personal life I was in a, a long-term relationship with an alcoholic and I just knew I could not survive in that relationship anymore so that was coming to ahead of me trying to leave that relationship and at the same time I had this very stressful job and the two worlds just kind of ran into each other and created so much stress that my brain could not handle it anymore for whatever reason you know the first psychiatrist I went to he said, you know, you were probably genetically predisposed to this illness and then something happened in your life and you're hit with like a Mack truck. And all of a sudden, you know, now you're having to deal with it. Plus, in the very beginning, I wasn't on the medication that is specific for bipolar illness. I was on antidepressant because that's all I presented with. That's all the doctor had, saw. You know, there was this like questionnaire that the doctor wanted me to fill out and he said, you're so depressed. And so when I started taking the antidepressant, it, it helped. But then, <laughs> I mean, it helped me to leave the relationship. It helped me so much, but then that's when things started getting out of control because it wasn't the right type of medication. And it is weird. Um, but wonderful that it was in jail that I was stabilized. D is everyone familiar with the Baker Act? Okay, so that's involuntarily hospitalized. I had had, God, I think three uh, Baker Acts. And I don't know if it, you, anyone knows someone that's gone through that. But From the jail and then they bring it back? No, I'm sorry. This was like I was living in the community. This it wasn't. This was before jail. Oh. Okay. When I left the relationship, um, it some things just were kind of crazy for me, and I was Baker acted. But you're only in there for like three to five days, maybe. Two hours. No, I was gonna say it's now. It's they've even brought it down to 24 hours sometimes, yeah. depending on your yeah. case. Mm -hmm. 24 yes. to 72, 72 is max. Yeah. Yes. So there's no way someone can get stabilized in that amount of time. And there's no way that you can give a proper diagnosis. No. And what's interesting is, so, so none of those hospitalizations helped me. Um, in jail, when I, once I got out, I read through paperwork about my case and the reports that the social workers and the psychiatrists had given me when I was in there. And, and when I first got in there, they diagnosed me as having schizophrenia. Okay. About a few months later, they, it changed to schizoaffective. Okay. Which I, I don't even know what that one is. I mean, it's just, you know, the schizophrenia, yes, I was hearing voices, I was seeing things that weren't there, I was delusional, I thought I had the cure for HIV. Um, I guess schizoaffective, because I'm not a psychiatrist, um, I'm, I'm not, I, I know from living it, but the bipolar illness definitely fits what I have been going through in my life. And that's when you, you, you get those, um, you know, depressions over here, manias over here, you know, it's, it's like mood swings, you know, that can happen frequently or not frequently. It just depends on each person. Our brains are completely different, so therefore we're gonna react differently to the, to the medication and everything too. And that's why jail was actually good, because I was in there for 10 months um, and, and to where they could actually watch how I reacted to the medication. Um, and what was good about it too is that it kept me safe 
being arrested and it kept other people in the community safe. Because honestly, I do not know what I would have done if I would have remained in the community because the anger and the rage that was coming up. And I was going into neighborhoods, which I was very familiar with during my day job with the health department. And we go in and educate people about HIV and AIDS. Um, but now I was going into those neighborhoods at two and three o'clock in the morning. And nothing really good happens in neighborhoods at two and three o'clock in the morning. Okay. Um, and, and being a, a crazy white girl, uh, <laughs> which was, I was creating so many scenes in these neighborhoods that wasn't good either. So people asked me, why do you keep taking the medication? It's been 10 years now. I have not had a manic episode, which is great. Uh, about four years ago, I did have to add an antidepressant to um, my routine, my, my medication routine, and I call it a tune-up. Because after a while, your brain gets used to different medications, and so you just have to, you may have to change something up. And what medication works for me may not work for another person. So now I'm on Depakote, okay? Uh, and that's to help the mania, and I'm on Wellbutrin, and that helps the depression. So it's, it's a good mix for me. But this is also the place where a lot of people stop taking their medication. And, and that's the question I get a lot is why do you keep taking it? I'm, I'm too afraid. I'm too afraid that my life is going to fall apart again and my life's never been better. I've never felt so good, which is awesome. And it's just taking medication just like, like I do for cholesterol. And so it's, it, that's worked out really well. Um, I don't do some of the things that I used to do um, before I, I knew I had bipolar illness. Like I used to be very like a social butterfly. Like I loved parties and I loved big crowds and I could <clears throat> talk all day long to people and then talk at night and play sports and just tons and tons of energy. It's rare that I'm around huge crowds. Um, I probably spend a lot more time like reading, kind of uh, alone time with my, with my dogs and family. Uh, just, it's just different than it used to be, but it's better than it used to be. Too. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Listening to your story, can you imagine a teenager life the same way that you have just stood there and described this, getting arrested, having the um, mania and the maniac, and getting arrested, having the charges and, and all of this? It's kind of, I'm speaking on my granddaughter because she had trauma. Mm -hmm. During, um, well, she's 14 during her childhood, and the exact same things you went through, she went through. Wow. Yeah, and, it's, and she had all the diagnoses you had and everything, but listening to you saying that you finally were diagnosed with the bipolar and it ended there, that diagnosis never came across it. It was the same ones that you said, the schizophrenia, the psychotic disorder, they diagnosed with all of that. She was on um, one of the meds you said, the well group trend. Mm -hmm. And um, she's on Abilify now, which I'm okay. a the therapist, and I think that is not what she's supposed to be on. But well, my question is it may sound stupid, but I'm going to ask it anyway. When a person is mentally ill, okay, the law knows it, everyone else knows it, why do they? make the charges stick when they have this outburst. That I don't understand. You know, I, I'm not saying that they shouldn't have consequences mm -hmm. because they, they should, but if right. they're mentally ill, they're not aware of the consequences. They're not aware of what they're doing. They're not even in tune with reality. Correct, you're right. So that's what I'm having a hard time understanding. And I can understand that, and, and that's looking back on my situation. Like, I didn't know I had a mental illness, but when, it was discovered that I did in jail and I got the diagnosis. 
why couldn't the charges have been dropped or well, changed? Lower. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, especially in the state of Florida, because there are some charges that are, um, they will never be taken off your record because uh, there's, and one is the one I have is assault and battery on two law enforcement officers. Um, so I'm not sure, but I, what I do know is since the time that I've been, that I was arrested, the Fort Lauderdale Police Department has a lot of officers that have gone through CIT training, which is crisis intervention team training, which teaches them how to work with individuals that have a mental illness. So in Miami-Dade, where I work, there's thousands of police officers that are trained. So um, it's not, they try to talk them down. They try to de-escalate them rather than bringing out the guns because that's what, when the guns were pointed at me and I thought they were going to shoot my dog, which meant the most to me, um, that's when I just went crazy, you know? But if they would have gone and they would have kept the guns in the pockets and they would have been able to talk to me in a calm voice and try that strategy, I really think it would have worked much better. And I think it's particularly difficult for teenagers and the families and what I've been hearing more and more of because um, I answer a, a hotline an 800 number and so families from Miami-Dade from the Miami area from from the state will call and what they're experiencing a lot is their the teenagers give off some some little signs you know maybe they're hanging with the wrong crowd or they're smoking pot and you know um, or they're doing um, mollies which is the, I think it's like... Pain pills too, you're doing the pain pills? Yes, a lot of the pain pills and doing different things. And, and the marijuana now is like a whole lot stronger mm -hmm. than it used to be. And so if someone is experiencing like psychosis, which they're hearing things and seeing things that aren't there, and then they're also engaging in the drug use, you know, are they using the drugs to help with the symptoms of that? Or are they doing it to get away from the voices they're hearing? Or are they trying to fit in with their friends? It just becomes a very complicated situation. Um, and there, there, I don't think there are very many good programs out there for teenagers. It's not, I was gonna say, I think the police department, um, every administrative in the school system, from the bus driver to the janitor, I think they all need to be educated on, on mental illness. Um, and it's so ironic because like the lady said over there, it's a curable disease and yet there's no resources, but you have diseases that are curable and you have a ton of resources and a ton of resources for them. Mm -hmm. So it's just so, just gonna say it, it's just, it's just the, the way the system works is, it doesn't work, it's broken. Yes. And, and it's like every time we get a person in the place, they blame that person. No, the system's been broken for years and years and years. Right. I don't care if you bring back old presidents that were good or other governor, governors that were good. The mm -hmm. system is broken mm -hmm. and it needs to be fixed. Mm -hmm. And it needs to start with mental health. Because yes. it's, Thank you. there are no resources out there. You're right. And, and what you were saying, um, about educating the bus drivers to all everyone. There is a course called Mental Health First Aid. And, uh, okay, we just awesome. Found out about, in the Senate class right before this, she also taught us about it. And she said that if she teaches it, the lady at Senate, she said that if they were, you were having trouble, like they didn't want to teach it because of funding or whatever, she also said there's a grant called Project Aware that will fund them teaching that. She said it's like CPR for, Health. Yes, yes. And, and actually the federal government recently passed a law um, giving a whole lot more money to the states through block grants that come from the federal government to each state government and then trickle down. Okay. What is complicated about Florida is that especially this last legislative se session, 
is we they didn't get anything done there was going to be all these new things with mental health um, in the state of Florida and there were two sides and they t couldn't agree so they butted heads and just nothing happened so they had to June 1st they started this new special legislative session to try to work some things out and that Medicaid expansion is also a uh, part of that too um, but there isn't enough funding okay Florida is 49th out of 50 states as far as the amount of money that our legislature puts forth to towards mental health it's horrible and as far as in Miami-Dade that is an urban area where we have like 13.1% of the people have some type of mental illness and they're in our jails down in Miami-Dade and, and I say that just because I'm most familiar with those is that you have so many people in there that they got arrested for trespassing because they're walking down the street and they're hearing a voice and it's in that abandoned house and it's calling me and so they go and then someone calls the police and they get charged with trespassing. They go into jail. They get released back to the community. They've never had any treatment and it just goes round and round and round. Yes? So I have a question. Like you talk about your story um, starting at 40 and probably a little bit right before that. With yes. Do you think that was like the onset of your bipolar or do you, so my child is 10, um, he is currently in a residential facility, it's like a res state residential facility. Mm -hmm. um, he isn't diagnosed bipolar yet due to age, but I've already been told by every psychiatrist it's coming. Um, do you think that, I don't know, like you probably don't know about your childhood, but hearing stories or siblings or your parents or people telling you that you probably were like that when you were younger and are you do you have any anger or any questions to the parents or people that were taking care of you why didn't somebody help me when I was younger or do you think it wasn't displaying like your childhood your teenage or any of that I do think that my mom and her brother have a lot of mania okay, okay? I've talked to my mom about it she's like no 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 you know big time denial okay um, my dad's family, there's definitely depression. His sister tried to kill herself and actually had the gun up to her head and her husband came in and they stopped it and they ended up getting her counseling. So there's that depression and that mania on both sides of my family. So the genetics are there, okay? Some of us some experience, some trauma will happen in our life where something manifests itself and comes out. And then some of like you can have two siblings and they go through exactly the same experiences. And one, you know, graduates high school, graduates college, no problems, whatever. The other one, you know, they're addicted to, you know, crack, you know, they have a mental health issue. And so you don't really know exactly, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg. Mm -hmm. You don't really know. I just wondered if you had any thoughts or feelings about someone not giving you help when you were younger, and if they even knew or if you weren't even really showing any. I don't think I was showing anything other than just um, being down here and there with, with the depression. I think because I got good grades, um, because I was active in sports, that it appeared, it appeared as if I was really healthy. Um, but I do think that as our society has gone on, that sounds like rain, huh? Yes. Um, I was thinking that it's either the rain or the air condition. <laughs> oh, it's, uh, oh, okay. For the next hour. Oh, wow. Um, what was I just gonna say? Oh, I think that our, our society has gotten more complicated. I think that it's much more difficult, I'm really giving my age away when I say this, but when I grew up, there were no cell phones, okay? There wasn't the computer, all right? There's, there was no like Instagram, social media, cyberbullying. you know, basically I went to school, I played outside, 
you know, the entire afternoon until my mom called us for dinner, you know? And, and to me, it was easier than what kids are facing today. Um, and I think that as that has happened, more youth are dealing with these issues and, and their parents have absolutely no idea how to deal with it. And no one's really out there helping them, you know. And even if you try to help them, they won't. I have a 16 year old, a 17 year old, and he's already tried to kill himself twice. Wow, I'm sorry. And it's rough, it's really rough. And you don't want to help. I don't want to help. You don't want to accept the help. That's the only thing, you know, because they, they want to help, but you don't want to. Right, exactly. And that's what's very, did you say, he, is he 16? Yeah, and that's what's really hard when they're 18. Not, not that you can make them do something right now. No, he turned 18 because they begged for back to him after he turned 18 and I couldn't do nothing. You know? Exactly. Said, He's going to have to call you and then he can tell you whatever happens because you don't have no right. Right. And, and, and I feel for families so much when that happens. And, and they call me on the hotline. Some have asked me to like come out and, and talk to the person that's experiencing the hallucinations or has tried to kill themselves. And nothing works, you know? And I think back on my situation. If I had not gotten arrested, I don't know what would have happened to me. And that's why it's like, I have to look at that as a positive intervention for me. Like saved your life. It did save my life, yes. And I was very lucky that I got arrested in Fort Lauderdale. Um, I really hope things change as far as the money goes, um, uh, you know, and funding things more and, and people really acknowledging that there is an issue with mental health. And why can't we have like um, billboards that say an 800 number so families and individuals can call or in the bus. When you're riding in the bus, there's these placards um, for advertisements and, and in the train too, where you could say if you're feeling down, if you're feeling like you can't sleep, you can call this number. Yes? Yeah, it's, it's like they, they're in the Baker Act or whatever, whatever. Um, 72 hours or whatever. Mm -hmm. But then they're left, they're left out to go again to, like you said, nothing. I mean, why couldn't they have something where they could, by law, put, in, put you in a place so that if you are doing drugs, you can get cleaned and whatever, but not to leave it up to, I mean, I, I just don't. They don't want to pay for it. No yeah, if there was something that could pay for, let's put them in for six months, get them clean, mm -hmm. get them on medication, Right. You know, because if they're not, you know, like in, in the instance of my grandson, they, unless he stopped using the smoking weed, then they couldn't help it. Mm. Because he needed to go and, and, and go into a place, and then he didn't want to go. But it should have been, I mean, if they took him in, they should have been demanded, okay, you need to, or keep him in their eye to help him. Like you said, I mean, because not everybody gets to go and, and you know, but it was, yeah. But it was, you know. Because one of my um, hospitalizations, I signed myself out. And you could do that against medical advice. Um, and that wasn't a good situation. Yes. That is why I said earlier that everybody needs to be educated, even different places yeah. in the community. Because in the school systems, is where the kids reside until they're out. Now, when they have manic actions in school or outbursts or meltdowns, whatever name you want to call them, mm -hmm. oh, we're going to send them to an alternative learning school. Yeah. Or uh, you're suspended for five days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, it's never seen and it's never acknowledged. Right. But I advocate for my granddaughter. I, I don't allow them to do that. That's because I'm a social degree. But anyway, mm -hmm. it's going to take people like you and I to have these things did. And what I'm thinking about is, because I spoke to him quite a bit, I don't know his face, the guy that works with this, maybe one year we can have some petition signed to mm -hmm. have all of this stuff put into place and to have all of this stuff did. Because 
and like she was saying, and like you were saying earlier in the conversation, they go back to your family. Has anyone had this or this may cause it or whatever? But we gotta remember years ago, no one wanted to talk about it. If something right. was wrong with one of our kids, we hid it or we sent them away to go stay with Aunt Sally in another state or something like that. Mm -hmm. So that plays a big part in it also. Yes, yes. I'll just say sitting in here with you guys, my son's 10, he's had six Baker X. I am his biological mother. He has a biological dad. He has a sister. We go to church. <laughs> he plays basketball and recreational sports. I don't have any really nice excuse. So all the people in our community slash in our life are like, what the heck? How do you do that to your child? And now and now he's in a residential facility by way of us. We went through the process. We fought with the insurance. We did everything because I don't want... Like, I'm just listening to you, and I felt guilty till I came into this no. room, and I'm just listening to you guys going, we knew why we did it, and our answer is because we don't want to be fighting with DJJ exactly. in four years from now. Right, yeah. right. And nobody, everyone thinks, our, thinks we're crazy, no. that's fine, mm -hmm. but, and we just kind of, me and dad and case manager in school helped me through, we all, everybody, we did it together, but now I'm just listening to you guys, and I just, it's the first time I'll just say, I'll share with you guys that I one of the first times that I felt like, I knew I was doing the right thing, but I'm just glad my kid's not 16 with DJJ before somebody's realizing, and other people have no idea. They're like, your kid's 10. I'm like, what the hell's wrong with you? And now, I'm in the, and now I'm just, I, support I just you. feel I thankful support because I, that was our thought process. Yeah. That's the best thing you could do. For it, it is because my granddaughter is 14 and I've lost count of how many times she's been Baker Act, how many times she's been arrested, things that are on her record. And I'm going through the process now trying to find a residential place to put her in because I don't want her life to be ruined when she becomes stable enough to function in society amongst her peers. Right. So that's what I'm looking for now, a behavior yeah. place for her. Ours was, I it's a long process. Like, my yeah. kid's also autistic, but he's verbal. Yeah. And whatever. <laughs> More yeah. verbal than he needs to be, obviously. But, um, so that part was hard. And then he was young. So most places, there was... So when they give you the list and you go through the insurance and you go through all the stuff, it does get less and less because they're younger. Your options of when they're younger, there's not many places. And then because he's also autistic, they're like, eh. But we toured a few and then we just finally found the right place. And he's only been there a little while, but he's not really mad. He's just like, eh, whatever. Like, we see him and he just, I think he knows because he does. He says he wants to go to school. He wants to play basketball. He wants to do like normal middle school things. But he knows that if he keeps, I mean, he's been bankrupted from school a million times. So not really, but you know, like so he knows what that later what that comes with. So mm -hmm. we just, but a lot of people are like, he's ten. What the heck? And really, I'm, I. Well, I really admire what you're yeah. doing. What you're doing. What you're doing. And 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 I want to say that no one is to blame for what your child has. I mean, basically, I mean, my mom and dad, I, you know, I have very now, well, my dad's in a nursing home now, but before he went into that and he was really able to um, process thoughts and, and everything, we would have talks about this. And, and he kept me, Every weekend, I'd call him from the jail, and he kept me afloat, basically, saying, you are going to be okay. You're going to be okay. You're going to get through this, no matter what. Um, and I had said some terrible things to him, too, when I was, you know, not in my right mind. Um, but he, I don't blame them. It's, it's just life. You know, life hits us and we face these situations that we don't know how we're going to get through. I can to the, say that there's power in prayer. Yeah. I, you know, if I didn't have the, the faith that I did when I was going through all this, I, I don't know what I, I would do. Um, if if the, the agency that helped me hadn't offered, I... Because I worked in the community before that in HIV AIDS, I like knew where the homeless shelter was, I knew where the food bank was. So in my mind, I thought, when I get out, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna catch, you know, and they let you out of jail at the very, like 
one or two in the morning, which I, I don't understand that either. Um, but you know, there I had this plan of what I was going to do, but not everyone, hardly anyone knows that. No, hardly anyone knows those situations of where the homeless shelter is or how to navigate the bus or you know where to pick up food and these different things. Um, so it is really difficult. I can say too that in, in Miami-Dade, all of the residential uh, facilities that we have for substance abuse, none of them are locked. So even if families can get a court order and have their family member court ordered to a drug treatment facility, that person can walk out at any time, okay? Um, which makes it very difficult too, you know? And there's some people when they call up and they want to get into these places, they'll say, I need a place that I can't get out of because I know that if I get out of there, I'm going to go use. So it is really complicated. But what you were saying about the petition, too, is I'm, I'm not on social media, but, but some people that I work with are, and they were able to create like some type of petition through, uh, a, you know, like um, social media somehow, you know, maybe on Facebook or something, you know, and people can add their signatures, and, and then they were to, able to send that to uh, legislators um, and that was due more about um, there was a person in um, I think it was down in Homestead in the correctional institution so he was in prison he had a mental illness and basically the guards killed him because the he was having a hallucination and somehow he had his feces and he put it on the wall and they wanted him to clean it up and he didn't understand what they were saying so they put them in the shower and and, and in this prison they were able to control the temperature of the shower from the outside so they did that and turned it up so hot and he was screaming in there and he he died and the way that this all got out into the news was that there was a psychiatrist that worked there who ended up getting fired because he was trying to create you know uh, media surrounding this and then other prisoners wrote letters to their lawyer and were telling about all these things that were going on Where was this? This was, I, I'm pretty sure it was in Homestead, Florida City area. But we, the, we don't even treat animals like that. Yeah, that's we don't just, treat animals like uh, that, right. Mm -hmm. And I think of the reason why a lot of mental ill citizens get abused is because they look like your everyday normal people. It's like an invisible it's, it's, disability. It's, invisible. it's mm -hmm. an invisible disability. Right. We look like everyday people that, and mm -hmm. that's why some of them, and that's why it's so hard for those jail um, attendants to say, okay, there's nothing wrong with you, you just do it. Because he probably looked at normal like you and I. Mm -hmm. And they don't see that, they don't understand. That's why I say it's so important to get this petition going to make everyone in position get educated. Right. Until they get educated, it's gonna still be a disaster. That's very, very true. Um, and, and two, you know, when, um, Whenever you hear, this is especially for females, whenever you hear a person doing weird things, don't they say, oh, she's bipolar? Yeah. You know, like when Britney Spears well, shaved her head and this yeah. and that, or, you know, and, and what I um, try to remind people is, I'm not bipolar. I'm Pam, and I have bipolar illness. Mm -hmm. But, you know, my mental illness is just a, a small part of me. It's something that I have to stay on top of and make sure that I'm doing what's good for me and what's healthy for me, but it's my personality is not changed because I have this. Um, and, you know, it's just, I, I wish you all, you know, the best in, in your family situations and, and just know that, that miracles happen. They truly, truly do, and I believe that, and I've seen it. I've worked with people that I don't ever think they're going to come back to reality because they're so far gone. Like I, I worked with a young woman and she thought she was Justin Timberlake's like cousin and that they had worked on a novel together. And, it, and so she believed that and 
the, she wouldn't take any medication. And finally the doctor said, you know, if you don't take the medication, and she was in this court ordered like locked facility, you know, I forget exactly how he was able to negotiate this with her, but he gave her the medication. She finally took it, but when she took it, she acted like she couldn't move her limbs, okay? Um, and so she would refuse to bathe herself. So that wasn't good for the whole unit. And so um, myself being a female and another female, uh, we had to assist her in this. And when I changed jobs, I remember leaving her and thinking this poor woman, she'll never be able to kind of make it out there in society. A year or two later, I'm down in like the south part of Miami-Dade and I'm at this, this uh, uh, facility and I hear Pam and I look and it's her and she's doing great. You know, and she'd been taking the medication and she was going to graduate from this program and move into an assisted living facility. And it's like, you know what, I can't ever, you know, I was able to do it, you know, and I can't ever doubt that for anyone else. And, and so, you know, just trust me that miracles happen and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that, that you're going through what you are, but um, I do believe that if enough of us pull together and we put some pressure on these politicians and um, that things will change. I really hope that, yes.